Vega 64 may consume more power than a GTX 1080, but how much does that impact room temperature? That's what we wanted to know, and we eventually expanded that concept to include how much a 940 watt mining machine increases room temperature, and how much a 600 watt machine, and so on. We were able to effectively replace any need of a heater for the past week as well, and right when it started to get colder. So in this test, we're looking at the room ambient impact of various PC builds and wattages, and whether or not you can replace your heater with your computer. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. Although this test is a little bit harder to control than our usual tests, to quote friend of the site VSG, it's the right balance of science, flaw, and madness to make for an entertaining educational video. And that's really what we were targeting. Something that's kind of real world, very interesting, and can be somewhat controlled if not perfectly. This test started off just trying to look at actually 1070 and Vega 56, but there wasn't enough of a power load there to even really begin the test. So we moved it up to Vega 64 and a 1080, and then we started ramping into the higher wattage units. And ultimately, this type of test is inherently very flawed, but we'll lay out everything we did for testing and then hopefully establish how it can apply to you uh, or where it applies the most. Because obviously when you're testing room scale temperatures, you're dealing with things like insulation, age of the house or building, the external temperature, what you're doing with AC or HVAC during the tests, and uh, if you're going to do things like block the door with a wet towel or anything like that to prevent heat from escaping. So there's a lot of places where there are decision points, and we chose to stick to mostly realism. So we're controlling to a point, and then we're trying to implement some more realistic scenarios for the testing. In preparing for these tests, we spoke with a thermal engineer in the industry and with VSG of Thermal Bench, and that helped us plan, but we did have to make a couple of decisions on our own. There are a lot of variables here. We're not going to attempt to control for all of them, but we discussed the possibility of, for example, testing in a thermal chamber, but the chambers we have access to and have used in the past are small, just big enough for me to stand inside of, so it would have heated up fast and wouldn't really relay real world room temperature. We ultimately decided to test in an actual bedroom, in an actual house, and this means we have four walls, insulation, a door, a small gap under the door, a ceiling fan, and all of the other things you'd have in a room. For room setup, we configured the ceiling fan to spin at a medium speed and left the 60 watt ceiling light on for the entire test, as this will generate a minor amount of additional heat, if insignificant. The idea is that a user who's trying to combat rising room temperature would probably have the fan on to some degree, and you'll probably have a light on while you're in there. We considered blocking the underside of the door with a wet towel to help isolate the room and the testing, but ultimately decided against it. There's no real point in controlling for that type of variable when there are inherently so many others with this type of test, and in a real world scenario, no user is going to do that. So we left that one out. We also did control for as much as we could the external weather factors though. We ran all tests on different days, giving the room time to cool down between each test. So we waited for similar or identical, as far as they can be, weather conditions outside to run the tests. And that meant that the test took a couple of weeks to run because we were waiting for the right conditions and also allowing the room to cool down rerunning tests as we found flaws with the methods and improving them and things like that. So there's a lot of data that was used to improve testing for the final data set. We also had to decide what to do with AC. So we considered disabling it entirely, but ultimately decided to configure AC to regulate a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. And here's the next challenge. The thermostat is located in the hallway outside of the room I'm in now that you're watching this on. The builds were on this table and the hallway uh, is not too far away. It's a couple feet away. So the thermostat's there, which means that the temperature sensor is also there. And AC won't trip until that sensor reaches whatever the value was, 70F in this case. So the temperature in this room is somewhat isolated, but as more heat sort of slowly seeps out under the underside of the door and gets out there, it will trigger AC. Now this was by design, and we're pointing it out for a few reasons. 
We placed a thermocouple down the hall in one of the colder rooms. This is the coldest room in the house. There's another one down the hall. Placed a thermocouple there. That's our control room. And then we placed two in here. One was one foot away from the computer where you would be sitting. The other one was in the center of the room, about six feet away from the computer. This room is sized at 15 foot four by nine foot nine. And we're measuring temperature every second or so over a period of several hours to allow steady state to be achieved if possible. Some tests went as long as seven hours and we're still not at steady state at the end, but I had to call it there. Uh, so just to give an idea, thermocouples again, positioned in two places in this room. And the point of all of this is to highlight that this is a, an imperfect test, but it's an academic experiment. It's, it gives us enough good data that we can still figure out how much a computer would heat up a room given these parameters that I've just spent the last few minutes laying out. So the point of saying all that is so you can figure out if it relates to you. And either way, we've controlled for our environment as much as possible, so it gives you a good idea. Now, if you're sitting in a warehouse or something like that, obviously your mileage will vary tremendously. If you're in a warehouse, probably don't have to really worry about this at all because it's just going to spread out. But uh, that's where we're starting. So your mileage will vary depending on your AC policy, things like that. But seemingly small things like keeping the door closed, which we did, can have a big impact on tests depending on how you do it at home. So your results would change based on that as well. Opening the door, for instance, would help a huge amount. Maybe for some reason you want to keep it closed. Maybe you have pets who jump on your test bench, for example. So those are our variables and our controls. Let's get into the data. So to recap our AC policy quickly, we had the AC on during the 900 watt mining machine test. It came on occasionally. And that's because if we allowed the room ambient to reach 40, 50 C, maybe not 50, but 40 C, that's obviously becoming a fire hazard. So we've got some limitations there. The AC was basically off in all the other tests because the room didn't get hot enough to seep heat out into the hallway and trigger AC. So it was on for 900 watts and basically off for the other two. We're starting with the most extreme experiment since that's the most fun one to look at. This is from our 940 watt temporary mining machine which used a mixture of four GTX 1080 and 1080 Ti GPUs. We had three TIs and one 1080, all configured to 70% power limits with 100 to 150 megahertz core overclocks and a 250 megahertz underclock. The fans were also blasting and we had a few fans positioned on the table to reduce heat in key locations. And the idea was to avoid burning down the video set. While all of these were going though, we also had the CPU burning for Kryptonite for which we used a 1950X under the Lick Tech 360 millimeter cooler. Power sat at around 940 watts at the wall, all said and done, and for results, here's what we got. Room ambient for this test started at around 20 degrees Celsius with our control room at around 20.4 degrees. At one foot of distance, the room temperature increases by five degrees within a half hour, and keeping the door closed, this of course means that it's going to be a bit more accelerated than if you opened the door. The temperatures at the one hour mark climbed to 27.5 degrees. For those using Fahrenheit, that'd be a climb of about 69 Fahrenheit to about 81.5 Fahrenheit in the span of an hour. Our AC kicks in at this point and regulates the control room and hallway down to the target temperature, where we briefly saw temperature drops in this test room of about 1.5 degrees. Between AC cycles, we managed to climb all the way up to about 30 degrees Celsius, following three hours of testing, and that's while AC was battling the temperature rise on occasion. In Fahrenheit, that puts us at 86 degrees, effectively eliminating the need for heating in the room during winter. Actually, it sort of starts necessitating AC. Middle of the room temperatures aren't quite as bad as being in the combat seat, with a maximum temperature of about 28.1 degrees. As for power consumption, the chart's about to get kind of messy. This green line mapped to the right axis represents power consumption during the test. This machine was running nice hash back before it was hacked, and that's what loaded the rig fairly evenly for the testing period. If you had a similar room set up to ours, a bedroom attached to HVAC and with its door closed, you're looking at high room temperatures from something like a mining machine or a rendering machine or anything that generates a 900 watt load. We went five degrees over control in just half an hour and reached nine degrees Celsius over in about three hours. And just to establish a point here, it doesn't matter how you generate the heat, it's still heat, it's still wattage. So if you are pulling 900 watts through some insane gaming machine or pulling 900 watts through a rendering machine or 900 watts 
through a mining machine, it's all 900 watts. Doesn't matter how you create the power in this instance, as long as it's created in a steady way, it will heat the room up in the same fashion. So it doesn't matter what you're using to create the temperature, basically, or create the heat load and the power load more appropriately stated. This next test is closer to a high-end gaming or production machine and consumes about 600 watts of power. Looking at this Firestrike chart from our GTX 1070 Ti review, we can see that a Crossfire configuration was pulling about 460 watts for the system, with our power modded Vega 56 at 447 watts for the system. A 600 watt machine would be similar to running two 1080 Ti's at full tilt with a lighter load on the CPU, or running a, an overclocked i9 CPU with a high-end GPU. This chart from our 7980XE review helps reinforce that. It's not hard to make CPUs draw 500 watts alone if you're running an HEDT class part. These CPU power charts were measured at the rails, so that's just the CPU for those. Knowing that, our next test is at 600 watts, so it's a bit more achievable, but still on the high side. This machine progresses somewhat linearly as the temperature never reached the point of tripping AC from the hallway sensor. The 900 watt machine had just enough heat seeping into the hallway that AC triggered more frequently. And so this test, once again, shows its imperfections and limited control. That said, it's good to see how the room temperature behaves when left uncontested by AC and is all ultimately experimental, not comparative anyway. With no AC to help out, the room temperature starts at about 20 degrees Celsius for all of our probes, reaching only 21 degrees after half an hour, so no big deal. By the one hour point, we're at 22 degrees. This climbs again to 24 degrees after two hours, so it's almost perfectly linear. Temperature still hasn't reached steady state, and so we allowed the test to run for seven full hours. At the end of all this, we're at 25.6 degrees and climbing higher, as it's still not perfectly steady state. That said, seven hours is a long time to run a machine at full tilt, so keeping with our theme of realism, if you're running a 600 watt machine for seven hours, you're probably rendering or encoding something, and that means you can probably exit the room if you wanted to. Our final test is the one that prompted all this. We know that Vega is power hungry, more power hungry than its direct competitors, the 1070 or the 1080 for 56 and 64. So we wanted to compare a 1080 to a Vega 64 card and see that given the higher power load created by Vega 64, is there also an appreciable change in room temperature with this particular room. So that's the next and final test. This test was a looping Firestrike benchmark for a few hours, and here's the power consumption chart. The Vega 64 system consumed about 360 to 380 watts on average, where the GTX 1080 system consumed 300 to 330 watts on average. This 50 watt peak to peak amplitude manifests itself minimally in room thermals, as you can see in this chart of temperature from the combat seat once again, a one foot distance. After a few hours, the Vega 64 card heated our room by about an additional 1 to 1.25 degrees Celsius over the 1080 card. And given the inherently difficult nature of controlling this testing, we can sort of write this off as functionally equal. It'd start mattering as you stacked more and more cards, but with single card gaming machines under gaming workloads with this type of power load, it's just not showing up in room thermals. This is also without AC ever triggering to even turn on. So there wasn't enough of a temperature change for it to fire. If the room were smaller, we had more machines running, or if it were already hot outside, this might be more noticeable. Our chart of temperatures from the middle of the room shows largely the same performance, though the temperatures are even closer as we get farther from the PC, making it even less relevant. And that pretty much wraps it up. So this testing was a lot of fun. It was different. Again, it's an academic experiment. The 900 watt to one kilowatt load, whether that's a gaming machine, overclocking machine, or mining, clearly creates a big impact. And just to exit all the objective data and speak subjectively, walking into this room at the end of the test, at the end of the mining test, was noticeable. It's like walking into a wall of heat. Like if you transition straight into a desert, basically. So going from 20 degrees on the other side of the door to 30 in here is definitely noticeable. It's enough to make you sweat a little bit, depending on who you are. And so that's an area where obviously you pay for what you're running in terms of how you feel personally in the room. Now, opening the door, again, subjectively, this wasn't measured, opening the door definitely helped a pretty good amount in terms of human feeling. Probably dropped the temperature by about maybe three degrees after it was allowed time for air to kind of circulate out of the room again. And so that would certainly help if you had that capability. Another option, of course, turn on AC to run it all the time or open a window or any number of things you could do to combat this. 
but uh, clearly within a relatively controlled environment, there is a, a direct increase in room temperature versus your computer's power consumption. So that's pretty cool. And this is where things come into play of how much does power consumption matter? How much does uh, heat load matter? All that, all that stuff. But uh, between two competing cards head to head, even with a, an 80 watt difference amplitude uh, peak to peak is obviously not a huge change. So I mean, we were looking at one degree for 64 versus a 1080 after a couple hours. Probably not gonna notice that too much in this type of room. Maybe if you were gaming in a really small room with no AC and you had other machines running, you might notice it at that point, but it doesn't look like it's gonna be nearly as noticeable as just going from something like single card to crossfire or SLI, for example. So that's all for this one. It was a pretty fun test to do. Let us know what you thought of this idea. Post comments below if you have similar test ideas to this one that are maybe less easy to control, but still fun from a scientific standpoint. And as always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. If you would prefer to not use Patreon, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to purchase a shirt like this one. Subscribe for more, and we'll see you all next time. Crossfire or SLI, for example. So that's it for this one. Kind of fun. Let us know what you think of this idea. Thanks. God damn it.